welcome everybody to our webinar today. Um, I'm glad you all showed up. So I'm going to teach you some stuff about SPAN and RSPAN. And just to set this stage here, so I, I'm taking this from the standpoint or the assumption that you know little to next to nothing about these two features that you can do on switches. So using that as a baseline, let's go ahead and get started. And uh, like Brittany said, feel free as I go through the webinar here to type in your questions as they occur to you. Uh, and once I'm done doing my presentation, once I'm done doing my demonstrations, I'll go ahead and take a look at those and, and give my best shot at those questions. So with that being the case, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. To start with, you might wanna take a screenshot of the image that I'm displaying right here. This is actually the lab setup I have. It's, it's off camera, but right here next to me, as you can see, I've got four routers connected to two switches. Uh, I'm actually using my MacBook as the device that has Wireshark running. So that's where all my span traffic is gonna go to. So I'm gonna be referring to this diagram a lot as I do my demonstrations and things. So if you have a, a snapshot of this, uh, it'll just make it easier for you to follow along with me as I go through that. So that being the case, let's go ahead and start with the need for network monitoring. I probably don't have to explain to you why we need network monitoring, but what it's referring to in this particular case is where you want traffic to flow through your switch as normal, but there's some traffic coming in, maybe particular interfaces, maybe a range of interfaces, maybe an entire VLAN, and you actually want copies of that traffic made and then the copy sent to a network monitoring device like maybe a laptop running wireshark an ips or an ids device uh, whatever so that you can monitor that traffic you, you can see what's going on and this is where span and r span come into play now if this is your desire if you want to monitor traffic if you want to copy the traffic maybe you suspect that there's some um, mischief happening on your network people are using your network for unauthorized purposes or you're just trying to get a better feel for you know what's on my network you know what are the typical applications that are using it when is it busy when is it not busy there's a whole range of reasons why you might want to copy the traffic and send it somewhere for analysis at your leisure so it's actually a, a, at a real high level a couple of ways you could do this so one method aside from span and r span is where you could select some interface, like for example, right here, and you could say, well, I'm actually gonna put a physical device in place right there called a network tap. And I don't know if you've ever seen a network tap before. It looks a lot like a hub. It's a little box that has, you know, two or three or four ports on it. And it goes in line between where the, 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 uh, the data is flowing. And the benefit of a network tap is that it's kind of like a hub and that anything that comes in is replicated and sent out not only to the switch, but to the port where your network monitoring device is connected. But above and beyond a hub, it has a lot of advanced features as well. For example, network tap can give you accurate timestamps of each and every frame that was sent to you. Um, if you're really concerned with the actual timing of things like, you know, from a legal perspective, it's important to you that you actually see the actual interframe gap between the frames and you wanna see if that was changed. You wanna see the timing of everything. A tap device can be really good for that. The downside with a tap is like you can imagine, you have to know in advance where you wanna put it. It's a physical device you have to insert between two other devices. And chances are you're gonna to wanna to do that in the off hours at like you know midnight or 2 a.m. when the network is not being used. So you don't incur any downtime by inserting that thing into your network. So what if that condition is not true? What if you say, hey, you know, I've got a need right now. It's two o'clock in the afternoon or 9 a.m. The network is very busy right now. And I know that right now I need to monitor traffic either going in or coming out of a particular port on my switch. I don't have time to put in a tap. Even if I was able to walk down there, I don't wanna plug and unplug that port because that's gonna cause some network downtime, might lose some critical services. This is where SPAN and R-SPAN come into play because these are features you can implement on the switch at a moment's notice. You can turn them on, you can turn them off whenever you want to, you can select whatever interfaces, it's not dependent on any particular hardware being in place. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about that. So 
going back to this. So SPAN stands for Switch Port Analyzer. And the idea here is that when you're configuring this command, you're going to be configuring two elements to it. You're going to be configuring your SPAN source, which is where, what interfaces or what VLANs do I want to monitor? What traffic do I want to copy? And then you're going to be configuring what's called a SPAN destination, which is where do I want my copy traffic to go to? And by the way, when you can, when you use SPAN, everything on the SPAN source is copied. It's not selective. So for example, if you configure SPAN in the receive direction, we'll talk about that in just a moment. That means anything received on an interface, whether it be a BPDU, a CDP packet, DTP, whatever it happens to be, will be replicated and sent to the SPAN destination for monitoring. So it's not selective. So the two forms of SPAN I'm going to talk about in this presentation are SPAN and remote SPAN. What makes them different? SPAN is the idea where your SPAN source and your SPAN destination, like the picture shows you right here, are on the exact same physical chassis. So this is great if your network monitoring device or your laptop running Wireshark is physically connected to the switch where the traffic is coming in that you want to monitor, where the suspect traffic happens to be. In a lot of cases, though, that's not the situation. In a lot of cases, maybe the switch I want to monitor is in one building of my campus, and me as a network administrator, I'm sitting across the campus in a completely different building, and the switch I'm connected to is not going to be my SPAN source. That's where you would use remote SPAN. Remote SPAN is the idea of on one switch, like here we see the switch on the left, you configure your SPAN source. So that's where you configure an interface or maybe a range of interfaces to capture traffic. And then that capture traffic is actually put inside of a special VLAN that we call a remote SPAN VLAN. That VLAN then tags it with a .1Q tag, sends it across a bunch of VLAN trunks to where your SPAN destination switch is. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Okay, so what are you monitoring? What can you capture with SPAN? So this is the first thing you have to think about. As I mentioned, you could select one or more physical interfaces to capture. You could select one or more VLANs, and there's a bunch of gotchas and caveats with this that I'll talk about in just a moment. And on certain higher end switches, typically the switches that have removable supervisors, like your 6800s, your Nexus switches, probably even your 4500s, you can actually capture traffic going to and from the switch's CPU. Don't have that ability in fixed configuration switches, unfortunately. And then your SPAN source could also be a remote VLAN. We'll talk about that in just a moment when we get to our SPAN. So let me point out a couple of important things about this. Number one, look at the second bullet point. When you specify a physical interface or a range of physical interfaces, you also get to specify the direction of the traffic that you actually want to monitor. Receive is like what it sounds like, traffic coming in that interface. Transmit, traffic leaving the interface, or both. You could do both directions. The default is both. So when you select your span source, if you don't specify a direction at all, it will default to both directions. By the way, if you set up a span session, and let's say my span source is a physical interface like Fast Ethernet 01, and I decide that on that span source, I want to monitor in the egress direction, so stuff that's leaving that interface. You, you'll actually see a lot of papers and stuff refer to that as an egress span session. So if you ever hear that term, egress span, that simply means we're monitoring stuff in the transmit direction. Okay, uh, as far as one or more VLANs are concerned, there are some caveats with this, and this really depends on the switching platform that you're dealing with. So if there's one takeaway that you get from all this stuff I'm going to talk about today is that before you implement SPAN or RSPAN, read the configuration guides because what one switch can do, another switch can't. The features and the availability of, uh, is, is ranges widely based on whether you're dealing with access layer switches, core layer switches, Nexus or iOS a lot of variations and, and no one's going to memorize all those little details but you will want to know that um and even before you purchase a switch uh you know it, you don't want to be in that unenviable situation where you buy a switch and it turns out oh this switch supports local span 
oh, but it doesn't support R span. Too bad. You, you don't want to spend your money and have find that out afterwards. Now, as far as VLANs are concerned, on some switches, for example, the higher end switches, you can specify a direction on VLANs. So receive would mean any traffic coming into the VLAN, even if it's going to be routed to a completely different egress VLAN, traffic coming in would be receive, and then you can do transmit, which would be traffic leaving the VLAN. That would also include traffic that came in one VLAN, was routed to the VLAN that you're concerned with, and then left on that VLAN, that would also pick up on transmit. Other switches only let you specify VLANs in the receive direction. For example, let me show you uh, some examples right here. So if you remember that picture I was in, uh, I'm gonna go to switch one right now. Now switch one is a is a pretty old switch. It's a Catalyst 3550 switch, which I don't think Cisco even sells anymore. And if I start configuring my my span session, the first words are monitor session. So we think of it as span or R span, but technically you're configuring a monitor session. And then you specify a number. Now this is talking about the quantity of span sessions that you can have in any given switch. In this switch, it's 3550 because it's a, it's a low end switch. The maximum number of span sessions you could have would be two. Uh, but for example, if I go over to another switch, for example, switch two, I think we'll see a difference in switch two. Switch two is a 3560 switch, not a 3550, but a 3560. If I do monitor session, yeah, see this one, I can have up to 66 sessions. So this is also platform dependent as far as how many concurrent span sessions can you have. Now, while I'm staying on the 3560 here, I'll create session number one, and there's my source, I'm going to say VLAN. Okay, source, I'll just select a VLAN. Now, notice on this switch, I can select direction, transmit, receive, or both. But if we go back to that little 3550 that we were just looking at, monitor session one, source VLAN two, notice here, I don't have a choice. Receive, that's it. I don't have a choice of transmit. So that's another gotcha or caveat depending on the switch platform that you're dealing with. So going back to the, the slide here, now, another uh, really important thing I want to point out is that if you're deciding to, as your span source, what you're going to monitor is a range of interfaces or an entire VLAN or a range of VLANs, you could get yourself into some serious trouble because think about where all that captured traffic is going. It's going to make copies of every frame it sees on that range of interfaces or that VLAN. All those copies are going to be sent out your SPAN destination port. Now, let's say my SPAN destination port is a fast Ethernet interface connected to my laptop that's running Wireshark. Okay. Well, what if I, if my SPAN source is like 15 fast Ethernet interfaces on the source side? Can you imagine what's going to happen if I have 15 interfaces and every single frame I'm sending, receiving, or both on all 15 of those interfaces is being copied and sent to one egress interface, which is my span destination, there's no way that's going to work. That span destination interface is going to become congested. It's not going to have enough transmit buffers or transmit queues to hold all that traffic and stuff is going to start getting dropped. So what I'll end up seeing is, you know, me as a network moderator, I'll, I'll be looking at my Wireshark and I'll be thinking, what's going on here? I'm, I'm missing a bunch of stuff. I know stuff is coming in that I'm not seeing here. Well, that's because it's being dropped due to congestion. Another reason why span traffic could potentially be dropped is that Cisco documentation states that if there's congestion in the switch, if a switch gets to a point where it says, oh, I'm about to die here, I'm going to have to start dropping stuff. I'm going to have to start prioritizing traffic. Well, guess what? Span traffic is put at the bottom of the list. Span traffic has a lower priority than data traffic. So if any traffic ever has to be dropped, the span traffic will be dropped first. So those are some things to be aware of with span. Now notice here the last bullet point. 
a span source may belong to more than a single span session. What's that talking about? Well, let's say I'm the network administrator and uh, let's go back to our, our picture here for a second. I'll just use this, okay? And let's say that what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a span session that was monitoring uh, maybe this interface right here. So this is gonna be my span source. So I'm gonna create a monitor session and I'll pick the first number, monitor session one, and I'll use that as my source. And you know, right here, this is my destination. That's where my, my laptop running Wireshark is. And so, you know, I'm gonna be capturing, and let's just say I'm doing everything on the, uh, the receive side, everything that's coming in that port. Okay, let's say my intent behind this is that I'm looking for unauthorized telnet sessions. Whatever is connected to that interface should not be doing any kind of telnet whatsoever. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, so that's my goal. Now let's say somebody else comes around. Let's say uh, Sally comes around. Sally is also a network administrator. And Sally decides, lost my mouse again. How nice is that? Okay, so she's gonna monitor this exact same port. She's gonna create monitor session two, and let's say that Sally's destination is right here. So her session is gonna be connected, that's Sally's PC. So the reason she's monitoring that exact same port is because she's looking for something else. Maybe she's looking for unauthorized UDP traffic or something like that. You can do this. Here we have two completely different monitor sessions running at exactly the same time but they're both using the exact same source, which in this case is the exact same interface. That's okay, that's perfectly allowable. Get rid of some of this stuff. Oops, don't want that. All right. Now we have to have some place where we send our span traffic, our copied frames, and that is our span destination. Now notice this first bullet point right here. A span destination could actually be more than one physical interface. Why would we want that? Okay, well maybe we have a situation like this where I'm creating a span session, but I have multiple objectives. Maybe I want all the copied traffic to be sent to my inner, so maybe my laptop is on port fast ethernet at zero slash three, that's where I'm sitting. And so I want that to go to my laptop so I can initiate Wireshark and I can look for that illegal telnet stuff. Maybe at the exact same time, I want all that capture traffic to also be sent to a different destination port, maybe zero slash seven, where I have my IPS box. So it's constantly monitoring all the inbound traffic, looking for signatures of you know, malicious attacks or denial of service or something like that. So in this case, I have a single session that's taking the replicated traffic and sending it to multiple destinations because I have different things connected to each destination, which is has a different objective in mind. You can certainly do that. A port identified as a span destination is monitoring. All other features are disabled on that port. Let me show you what that's referring to. So here on switch number one, I'm gonna create my source, monitor session one, source interface, and we'll do fast ethernet zero slash one. That's connected to router one. Okay, now monitor. Now before I do my destination, check this out. Show interface fast ethernet zero slash three. If I could type zero slash three. So that's the interface is actually connected to my, my notebook right now, my MacBook. And you can see it's up, line protocol is up, connected, everything's great. Now watch what happens to that interface when I convert it into a span destination port. Monitor session one, I wanna keep it as part of my existing session. Destination. Now here, because I'm doing this on a really low end 3550 switch, you're gonna see something which you'll probably never see 
on any other switch, not that I'm aware of anyway. And I don't know if you guys have any 3550s in your environment, so you might never see this at all. But if I say interface, fast ethernet zero slash three, all right, so that's where my notebook is, is connected. Uh, switch one, serial connection. Just one second here. This is switch one, right? Yep, yeah, switch one. Make sure I'm in the right switch. I can talk about it verbally if I don't see it. We saw it in the last session, so it's trying to throw me for a loop here. Yeah, 3550. Oh, okay. This is because I'm doing a span session and not an R span session. Okay, so that thing... What I was gonna talk about was something called a reflector port. I will get to this concept of a reflector port, but we have to get into R span first because it is only applicable to R span. So hold that thought. Monitor session one, destination interface, fast ethernet zero slash three. And there's some other options here, encapsulation and ingress. I'll talk about that in just one moment. For now, I'm just gonna hit enter. Okay, so now look at that interface. Show interface fast ethernet zero slash three. And notice that physically it's up, but now the line protocol is down monitoring. What does that mean? That means a couple of things. Number one, that means that if my MacBook tries to send anything ingress into this port, whether it be an ARP request, DHCP, web browsing, whatever, it's gonna be dropped. Nothing is going to be allowed ingress on that port. Secondly, it means the only thing that's being sent or transmitted out of that interface is stuff that was captured by SPAN. This interface is no longer a regular switch port. If it was an access port, it's not anymore. If it was a trunk, it's not anymore. The only thing that's being allowed out of that interface is SPAN traffic. Spanning tree is no longer active. Show spanning dash tree interface fast ethernet zero slash three. See that spanning tree is off. There's no CDP. There's no DTP. Now, as I say that, watch this. I'm going to go ahead and turn on Wireshark. All right, right here. And we see, wait a second. We're seeing BPDUs. Keith, you lied to me. You just told me that spanning tree is disabled on the interface. So how can we see BPDUs popping out of that port? Well, here's what's going on. Don't let this fool you. Keep in mind that when I created my span source session, let's go back to this picture here. I selected fast ethernet 01 as my span source. And what direction did I do? I didn't specify a direction. So it defaulted to both. Well, the span source port is still doing all the normal stuff that port does. That port, 01, is participating in spanning tree. So every two seconds, he's sending out a BPDU. And guess what? Because my default direction is both, anything transmitted out of 01, including CDP, BPDUs, all that good stuff is being replicated and sent to my MacBook on port 0 slash 3. So these BPDUs that we see right here, let me get back to this. These are not natively coming out of zero slash three. These are replicated BPDUs that were originally sent out zero slash one. The only way I could sort of prove that to you is if we capture one of them and we look at the spanning tree port ID, 8001. So this is the, the port ID for port number one. Uh, for example, if I changed it, well, I'm not, oh, we can change it. Why not? Show, run. By the way, all of your span configuration, when you're looking through your running config, is all the way down at the very bottom. So we got to scroll past all this other stuff. There it is. So here's what I'm going to do, just as a, an example. I'm going to get rid of the source, 0, 01, and instead I'm going to put in a 0 slash 2 which is also up, show monitor. Okay, now we've got 
zero slash two transmitting in both directions and see that see our port id now is 8002 it has changed so that confirms that these bpdus are not natively coming out of fast ethernet zero slash three where my laptop is they're coming out of my span source ports let's change this back to where it was Okay. All right, so uh, our, our command we can see here is show monitor to confirm that we have a span session going. We see the session number. In this case, it's a local session. It shows us what our source port is. It could be a VLAN. It shows us what our destination ports are. Encapsulation native. What that's referring to is the default behavior of span and our span is that when a frame comes in on a span source port, let's just assume we're doing it on a physical interface for now. When a frame comes in, it doesn't matter if that frame was a native ethernet frame or if it was tagged with .1Q or even if it had an ISL header on it. The default behavior of span is, it'll just take whatever the native ethernet frame is and send that to my span destination port. So that means if a frame comes in with an ISL header or a .1Q tag, I'm not going to see that in Wireshark. Let me prove that to you as well. So right now, my span source port of fast ethernet 0 slash 1 is connected to router 1, if you remember that picture. And if we take a look at router 1 on his fast ethernet interface going back to that switch, notice that I've got an IP address on my physical interface. So any, any IP packets are created with that source address will go out as normal native ethernet frames. But I also have a sub interface. Got a different subnet on there and that's doing tagging. So any IP pack I create with a source address of 12.12.12.1 will have a .1Q tag of two. Now here's what I'm gonna do is my test. I'm gonna ping something in that network that doesn't actually exist. My whole point is I want this guy to send some traffic with that tag. In this case, he's going to ARP for 12.12.12.77. He's not going to get an ARP reply, but I don't care about that. I just want him to create the ARP, which will have that tag on it. And I'll show you that that tag does not show up in my captured traffic. All right, so he's ARPing. And there it is right there. Okay, let's just stop this for a moment. So there it is, and if we open it up, no mention of a tag, right? We don't see it on there. Now you might be thinking, well, Keith, how do you know it even had a tag to begin with? Maybe that's actually the way switch one received the frame. Ah, good question. Well, let me prove to you. So let me go back here, and this time I'll go into my switch, and I'm gonna change do show run begin monitor I'm going to change my destination command. I'm just going to redo it right here. But this time, I'm going to use the encapsulation keyword. Now, notice that on this particular switch, this 3550, I only have two options, .1Q and ISL. The way this works is that if I choose .1Q, which is what I want, now, if a frame comes in, as a native untagged ethernet frame, that's what I'll see in my span destination. If the frame comes in and actually has a .1Q tag on it, that tag will be preserved and I'll see the tag in Wireshark. Or I could select ISL. Now on this particular switch, I might have a problem because what if my objective was, what if I said, hey, I've got multiple interfaces that I'm using as a span source. Some of them are access ports. There's not gonna be any tag on receive frames there. Some of them are trunks doing .1Q and some of them are trunks doing ISL. I wanna see all of it in Wireshark. I couldn't do that. On this platform, my only choice is one or the other, .1Q or ISL or nothing, which is the native. Most switches though, I think most switches, you will actually see a third option in here, which is the word replicate. That's probably what you want to pick, because if you put the word encapsulation replicate, like it sounds, that means, hey, however that frame looked when it was received on the span source, 
preserve it in exactly that same format when you send it to the span destination. Keep the ISL header, keep the dot one queue tag, keep as a native frame, whatever it is. Unfortunately, on this platform, I don't have that as an option. So now we should see that when I do that exact same ping, stop. And there we go. See that? There is our tag. Now we can see the dot one queue tag was actually preserved when span copied it or replicated it and sent it to the span destination. So that's what the encapsulation keyword does. Now the ingress keyword, I'm gonna wait on that for just a second because the real power of showing you what that command does and doesn't do is actually more apparent when we're dealing with our span than when we're dealing with span. So I'll, I'll hold off on that. And a span destination may only belong to a single span session. So this is a little bit different than we were talking about span sources. Imagine that same scenario that we were just looking at. Okay, so here we were, and we had uh, both me and we had Sally. We're using this exact same port right here as our span sources. I was creating a, a monitor session one, she created monitor session two. But what if I had connected to this switch a hub? trying to write with a mouse here, so please forgive me. And I'm connected to that hub. Okay, there we go. Wow, handwriting just got progressively worse. And Sally is right here. Oh, that's just painful, isn't it? Okay, so anyway. So now we have an objective where my monitor session one and my monitor session two both want to use this as the destination port. You can't do that. A physical interface can only be a destination for one session, not multiple sessions. So bear that in mind. I get rid of this stuff. All right. All right, so we've seen the basic configuration of a local span session. So just as a rehash right here. Show run, go all the way down to the bottom of your config. Here's a local span session, right? My source interface and my destination interface are on the exact same box, exact same chassis. And we talked also about what the encapsulation command does. So we've talked about that. I've mentioned how you use the show monitor command to verify what you've got. So now let's move on to R span. So as I mentioned earlier, R span is this idea where the switch where your span source ports are is a completely different chassis than the switch where you're sitting with your Wireshark laptop or your IPS or IDS box or something like that. So how do we get switch one is our span source to copy the traffic and then send that copied traffic over to switch two. And when switch two gets it, how does switch two receive it on the ingress and realize, oh, this isn't regular traffic, this is span traffic. I need to send it to my span destination port. Well, the way we do this is by introducing something called a remote span VLAN or an R span VLAN. So on both of these switches, we're gonna have to configure a VLAN that's not currently in use, so we can't use an existing access VLAN. Think of a VLAN that you don't have right now, like in case this case, VLAN 300. You configure as normal, but under the config VLAN, we actually designate it as a remote-span VLAN. Now, if I had like five switches or 15 switches end-to-end, -end, every single switch would have to be trunked end-to-end, -end, sort of like VLAN trunking protocol, how you need VTP, how you need trunking all the way through. We have to have trunking, and all those switches would have to have the exact same VLAN configured, and they would all have to know that this is an R-span VLAN. Now, I, I don't know, architecturally speaking, why this is the case. I actually tried doing a lab where I had a string of switches, and I thought, okay, well, what if the two switches on the end 
know that the VLAN is an RSpan VLAN because they're doing span. They've got monitor session commands. But what if the switches in the middle don't? What if the switches in the middle just have the VLAN configured as a normal VLAN and I don't put the remote dash span keyword? Will the frame still pass on through? And it turns out they don't. They don't pass through. I don't know the mechanics or the hardware of what's enforcing that, but I can tell you all the documentation is correct. All the switches in the line have to know that this is a special R-SPAN VLAN. So that's step number one. On switch number one, your span source will be exactly like what we just did in the example. Your span destination, however, is no longer a physical interface. Now your span destination is that remote VLAN, remote VLAN 300. So what's gonna happen is as stuff is coming in or going out of your span source, depending on what direction you've selected, receive, transmit, or both, those frames are gonna be copied and now they're gonna be, they're gonna go out every single VLAN trunk you've got on switch one and they're gonna be tagged with VLAN 300. And this is where I want to show you this thing that I was alluding to earlier. So we're gonna use the same picture. All right, so in this particular case, um, I'm gonna start by configuring my switch one here. And let's just take a look at this. Okay, so let's uh, delete my existing span session. No monitor session one, that's all you need. You don't have to copy and paste all the details of both the source and destination commands. Now step number two is create that RSpan VLAN. So I'll just use the same VLAN that was in the slides, although it could be anything. Remote dash span, there we go. Okay, so now I'm gonna configure my source just like normal. Monitor session one, source interface, fast ethernet zero one, okay. Now monitor session one, destination, remote VLAN 300. Now, if this was 99% of the switches that Cisco sells, I could just hit enter right here and I'd be done with it. But because this is a 3550, I have to put in something called a reflector port. What the heck is that? Now, like I said, you're probably never going to come across this. Here's what a reflector port is. You go over to the picture. On the 3550 platform, and there might be one or two other platforms, some older platforms that have this, but switches they sell these days, I don't think you're going to run across this. See, the idea is that if this is my source, and if I've configured VLAN 300, as my R span VLAN. On the 3550, something about the, the, the ASICs, the hardware connected to this port, it's unable to copy the traffic and put it into that R span VLAN. It can't do it. So, what you have to do is you have to take a port that is unused, not connected to anything. You're basically burning up a port, you're not going to be able to use it for anything else. Let's say it's uh, you know, 0 slash 11 as an example. And then I would, I would say that is my reflector port. And what I'm basically doing is I'm, I'm borrowing the hardware of that interface. I'm saying, hey, interface, you're not connected to anything. But I'm going to borrow your ASIC because you're not doing anything. You have the ability of taking the span traffic and putting it into VLAN 300, the R span VLAN. Only the reflector port can do that. Now, like I said, don't worry too much about this. Highly unlikely you guys will ever see this in your environments. But in case you ever do, now you know that's pretty much a Catalyst 3550 thing and that's, that's something that's uh, about the hardware on that. Okay, so for that reason, I'm gonna reverse the direction here of my, of my span, of, of my R span. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna have switch two have the source. I'm gonna put zero slash four as my span source. He's gonna put it into the R span VLAN as his destination. So let's do that first on switch two. Let's get rid of this. So no monitor session one. Now switch to 
he's a fancy dancy Cisco 3560, which isn't really all that fancy, but he doesn't have that reflector port problem. We don't have to worry about that. So here, we'll still create the VLAN, designate as a remote span VLAN, because otherwise it's not gonna work. Okay, so now I'll say monitor session one, source interface is gonna be fast ethernet zero slash four, that's connected to my router four. Monitor session one, destination, remote, VLAN 300. Notice, no reflector port, didn't have to worry about that. Okay, so I'm done on switch two. Now move back to switch one. Monitor session one. Now in this case, his source, where's the traffic coming from? It's coming from that remote VLAN. And the destination will be where my MacBook is connected. Destination, interface, fast ethernet, zero slash three. Okay, and now, do I still have Wireshark up and running? Yep, let's go, go ahead and shut that off for a second. Let's turn it back on. And now if we go back to this picture here, if from router one, if I ping router four, well, because this is my source and I have it in both directions, then when the ICMP echo request is being transmitted out that interface, a copy of it will be sent back here, which is my destination port. And then when this guy sends his ICMP echo reply, a copy of that will be sent right here. So let's just, let's just go ahead and take a look at that. All right, so ping 2224. There we see it. We see the echo requests and the echo replies. Now here's, um, it's not a huge downside necessarily, but this is a sort of a potential downside of, of our span, which is, if we go back to my picture here, imagine for a moment that my R span source, which is this interface right here, what if that was trunking? Doing, you know, probably 802.1Q. Now in a local span session, if I wanted to, in my span destination, I could use the encapsulation keyword and preserve the tags. I could see what the tags looked like as they came in the span source. Unfortunately, with our span, I lose that ability because even if that fast ethan 04 is trunking and it's using various tags, what's going to happen? Well, when the frames come in, switch two can't double tag it. When switch two receives it, He's going, to take a, he's going to take the native Ethernet frame without the tag, put it into the R-span VLAN of 300, and send that across the trunk. So if on switch one, and uh, well, we, we can I can show you this. So let me go to R4 for a moment. R4. Okay, and show IP interface brief. He's using fast ethernet zero zero. So I'm gonna do the same thing like I did in router one. Interface fast ethernet zero zero, let's just say dot uh, 55, encapsulation dot one Q 55, IP address 5555.4. Okay. Now, same, same thing. If I ping something that doesn't exist in that subnet, he's going to create an ARP request. That ARP request will be picked up by span. In this case, when he pings, it's going to have a tag of 55. Now, watch what happens here. First, I'm just going to, there it goes. And 
interesting. So we don't see it at all here. Well, I think the potential reason for this, SPAN is also sort of tied into the forwarding engine of a switch. Uh, if a forwarding engine of a switch under certain circumstances decides this frame is illegal or I'm gonna kill this frame, sometimes you don't see it in SPAN. And I think that's what's going on here is right now, if I go back to this picture, R4 is sending stuff this way with a VLAN tag of 55, but VLAN 55 does not actually exist in switch two. So I suspect what's happening is switch two is saying, I have no idea what to do with this. I don't even know what VLAN 55 is. And because it's having a problem with that, in turn, span is saying, okay, I won't copy it then. So if I'm correct, if my theory is correct, if I create VLAN 55 and switch two, we should at least see a copy of that frame. Okay, and um, or an even easier solution might be that that port on the switch was not trunking. That port on the switch was configured as an access port and an access port should not receive any tag frames at all. So whether it came in with 55 or two or 33, the access port was provided to saying, oh, kill you, no tags are allowed. So let's go ahead and um, Let's configure that as a trunk. Your face fast ethernet zero slash four. Switch port trunk encapsulation dot one Q. Switch port mode trunk. Now we should have no reason for not accepting tags, especially tags with 55, because he knows about VLAN 55. Okay, it is on. Let's make sure that everything is in the forwarding state on that interface. So we don't waste time with that. Okay, it's listening. Let's do it. Let's make it easy for ourselves. Interface fast ethernet zero slash four. Shut it down. Spanning dash tree port fast trunk. No shut. All right. Don't have to worry about spanning tree latency here. Forwarding. All right. So let's try that little ex that test again. Come on. You can get there. Okay, ping 12, 12, nope, not 12. It was 55, I believe. Okay, so he's creating an ARP request. There we go. Okay, so notice it's coming in. So I'll just stop that there. So in theory, what's happening is that it's coming in this way with a tag of 55. Switch two is doing two things with this frame. Number one, he's saying, well, I'm gonna, it's a broadcast, so I'm gonna flood it across anything that's in 55. So he's, he's flooding it this way and this way because both these interfaces are trunk. So he's tagging it with 55, he's preserving the tag there. But at the same time, because that came in on a span source, he's taking a copy of that frame and sending it across here with 300, because that's my R span VLAN. And then that is what shows up here. Now, because this is my destination though, I did not configure the encapsulation keyword. So because I didn't configure that, I don't see that tag. Now, if I do configure the encapsulation keyword on that device, I should see it. But I'm not gonna see the original tag. What I'm gonna see is just the RSpan tag.
Sometimes we got to do this test a couple times here. Stop. Start. All right, so here it is. And there we go. See that? 300. So with R span, unfortunately, you lose the ability of seeing what the original ISL header or 802.1Q tag is. The best you can do is see what the R span VLAN tag is, and that's that's all you have visibility to. Now, the last thing I want to talk about was the ingress keyword. And I'll just I know we're running almost a little bit late here, and I want to have plenty of time to take some questions. So I'll just verbally describe what that does. So when I first read about the ingress keyword, and if you actually take a look at the the parser and how it describes it, monitor session one destination interface fast ethernet zero slash three, okay, ingress it says enable ingress traffic forwarding. So this is how my brain worked when I first saw that keyword. I thought, okay. I understand that when a, a span destination interface is configured, that interface is in the monitoring state, which means nothing is allowed in, and the only thing allowed out is span stuff. And I thought to myself, well, what if that was connected to my laptop, like it is right now, and while Wireshark is running and getting copies of those frames, I still want to be able to browse the internet, look at my email, and, and do all that other stuff. Well, this seems to be my solution, right? Just enable ingress traffic forwarding, but it doesn't work. And here's the reason it doesn't work. When you enable ingress, it does allow the span destination port to now receive ingress traffic. What it doesn't do is it does not change the forwarding or transmitting behavior of that port. That port is still only going to transmit to you stuff that was captured by span which means that if i try to send something out like for example web browsing right let's think about how web browsing works if i brought up let's say i enabled ingress all right and then you have to specify what vlan okay so now i bring up my browser and i type in ine.com what's going to happen well, the first thing that's going to happen is my, my laptop is going to create a DNS request. It's going to say, okay, let me create a DNS request, going to the DNS server, trying to resolve INE.com to an IP address. So that will actually get to the DNS server. I have allowed ingress. It will be allowed in. It will be switched out to wherever it needs to go. Here's the problem. When the reply comes back, if the reply even makes it back to my switch, my switch will say, hey, I can't forward that reply out this interface. The only thing I can forward out that interface is span traffic, and that's it. If a packet was not captured due to span, it's not allowed out my span destination port. So you might think, well, then what's the purpose of ingress? Why do I would I even need this in the first place? The best explanations I can come up with and I've read about is that this was really designed where if your span destination port was connected to like an intrusion prevention system, an IPS box. And a lot of IPS devices, the way they prevent intrusion is let's say, for example, there's some sort of TCP based attack, some sort of TCP SYN attack or something like that. Well, if that's coming in a span source and that's replicated to your IPS box, your IPS box says, oh, uh oh, I see a TCP attack, it's coming from 2.2.2.2, your IPS box in an attempt to stop that can actually send like a TCP reset message back to the source of the attacker trying to reset the TCP connection. Now, when it does that, it doesn't expect any response back, right? When, whenever you send a TCP reset to kill a connection, you're trying to kill the connection. You don't expect anything back. You don't want anything back. And that'd be an, an example of the ingress keyword. You say, hey, I want to allow frames to come in here to maybe stop denial of service, but I don't need anything back. I just want one-way communication to come in this port and get to my get to the attacking device. That's what ingress is all about. All right, so with that, that pretty much concludes everything I want to say about span and RSpan.
So everybody, I, I appreciate you watching me and uh, and let's see if we have any time for any Q&A. Perfect. So uh, thank you again, Keith. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, go ahead and write them in that question box um, right around the middle of your little dashboard. Um, we will um, answer any that come up um, in the next couple of minutes. Um, also, if you think of something after the fact, um, you're more than welcome to email Keith your questions. Um, Keith's email is kbogart, B-O-G-A-R-T at ine.com. Again, that's K-B-O-G-A-R-T at ine.com. Um, it looks like we might have one question. Also, I just wanted to make a quick note that um, this recording will be available after um, the webinar is completed. Um, it will probably be a couple hours or so, but it will be emailed to you to um, the email address that you registered with. So um, be on the lookout for that as well. And I will turn this back over to Keith. It looks like you have a couple of questions. Let's see. All right, thank you, Brittany. So yeah, we've got a couple of questions here. Let's go ahead and hit these up. Um, so the first question it looks like is from Carlos. Thank you, Carlos. So you're asking, uh, do RSpan span copy .1Q tags, or is this only for RSpan? So we talked a little bit about this. So if you want to copy the the original .1Q tag or ISL header, and you want to see that in your network monitoring device or Wireshark, pretty much you have to use local span, where the source and the destination are on the same physical chassis. You lose that ability when you're talking about RSpan. In RSpan, the only tag you'll ever see is the actual remote VLAN tag. You won't see the original tags. So thank you for that question. And uh, Carlos, you also asked about cost tags. So class of service is actually a component of your .1Q tag or your ISL header. So if you recall sort of how those are put together, in the .1Q tag, you've got three bits for priority, which is used for, for quality of service. If you actually do set those three bits, what you're doing is cost. You're doing class of service. And within the ISL header, you also have three bits. There's a field for that for priority. That's also called cost. So it, it goes right back to your original question of the only way you would see those cost bits is if you're doing regular local span. You wouldn't see them with R span. All right, it looks like from what I can see here, uh, that is it for questions. Okay, that was uh, pretty easy. All right, so thank you everybody for watching today. I hope it was informative and used to you. I hope it turned on some light bulbs in your head as far as how SPAN and RSPAN works. And I look forward, hopefully, to seeing you on our next webinar in April, in which I'm gonna be talking about load balancing with spanning tree and other fascinating topics. So I will see you all in about a month. I'll see you then.